Hey there, Muscle Intelligence Nation. Welcome back to another episode. I'm your host, Ben Pakulski. Today we sit down with Yoda. So some people have said that I'm Yoda, and I will push that off and say, if anything, I might be a young Luke Skywalker uh, trying to follow in the footsteps of Yoda. And today is literally Yoda uh, to the entire exercise world and to me, someone who's taught me more about my thought process, more about life through exercise than anyone on the planet, uh, as you guys have heard in the past and you'll hear today. This man's mind is absolutely incredible. Tom Purvis joins me today and shares his passion for exercise that is second to absolutely no one. And his wisdom is far beyond anyone that I've ever experienced, uh, bar none. He is the guy when it comes to understanding exercise. And I sit down with him in his gym in Oklahoma City and pick his brain about some interesting stuff that I think is very, very imperative. Uh, when it comes to exercise. So understanding some of the process, particularly how breath and breathing mechanics can implicate movement and, and movement and movement success. We get into a lot of really interesting conversation on exercise and really how to start thinking about exercise in a different way. As I said, if you're interested in exercise at all, it's not complex. Uh, it's just misunderstood. And Tom is by far the top of the totem pole. And if you want to understand exercise, go over to exerciseprofessional.com and buy all of his courses. So obviously, if you're new to this, you could start at level one and just stick your big toe in. But my suggestion is you're going to love it. There's over 160 hours of content on there now. And he just goes deep into every topic. If you want to have a PhD in exercise, go over to exerciseprofessional.com and purchase all of those courses. And when you do, Thank me later. All of your clients will thank you and your ability to make money will go through the roof because your thought process will be completely different, especially if you're a coach. Uh, if you're just someone who wants to live, live a fit and strong life, understanding how your body moves and works, I think is imperative to living a life without injury, understanding how all these things kind of integrate. One of the greatest things that Tom did for me is challenge, ask me or, or offer the opportunity for me to change the way I thought you know, challenge what you think you know. And you guys hear me talk about that a lot. And a lot of what Tom has taught me through the years comes through in my messaging. Eternal gratitude for Tom. And um, I hope you all love this conversation. And if you do, listen all the way to the end. Head over and follow Tom on social. Head over to excessprofession.com. And don't forget to subscribe to Muscle Intelligence. Enjoy the show. I took an interpretation of your word when you talk about the structural, mechanical influences in breathing. So my brain goes straight to I'm going to loosely call it orthopedics, meaning how do your joints, we could say bones, but it's really joints, and they're influenced by muscles, et cetera. When you start talking breathing, there's more than just muscles. But So that to me is mechanics, right? That bleeds over into lots of other things. And that's a problem. I'm going to try to get back to what we were talking about. It's a problem to me when someone has multiple things in their head and can't delineate. So someone might go, no, 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 it's all about it's all about oxygen exchange and blah, blah, blah. It's like, yes, that's Different. the chemistry. I'm not saying you are saying sure. that. But people clump together, right? So when, when you say mechanics, I kind of try to go straight to mechanics as I, I you know what a mechanics is, so I'm, I was assuming we're on the same page. Mm -hmm. And so the thing I was saying was, there's a direct, not indirect, but a direct relationship between rib cage volume in two directions, this thing we call pump handle, and mm -hmm. it's an old name, like yep. a like an old water pump, like yep. on you know a show nobody's seen called Bonanza or whatever. <laughs> you know what I'm talking mm -hmm. about? And then there's a bucket handle, which hopefully, and it's so funny when you say bucket handle to people in class, and I go, you know what I mean? And they're like, have they never fucking seen a bucket? Right. So you've got these ribs that are, in essence, connected in front and back and have varying degrees of mobility from lower to upper, and the floating, you know, those little non-anteriorly attached ribs really are just, a piece of the puzzle, but not much because they don't involve the pump handle. Anyway, so you, let's call it collapse the thoracic spine. You go into more kyphosis and we got to get clear. This is the problem. Everything has a foundation. To understand the word kyphosis, we got to step back from the BS taught in fitness, which is typically, oh, you've got a kyphosis. We need to fix it. Kyphosis is a direction of curvature. And if you don't have a degree of kyphosis, then you have a perfectly straight thoracic spine, you're screwed, sure, right. right? So it's about degrees. Nobody knows what that word means. They shorten and sound bite. And anyway, anyway, so that's a, a degree thing. So when this increases in kyphosis to some degree, I'm trying to do it with the camera too, um, it's associated with your ribs. It's hard for them given that they are attached to every inter 
vertebral space, right? They're actually like a little demificet anyway. So when the spine bends more, the pump handle goes down more. And in concert with that, the bucket handle comes in more. Right. So it's almost like I, I, in class, it's actually over there in the classroom, but I've got a little dinky model, but it's, it's, it's rubber. And it's perfect because if I collapse the sternum in, you start to see that from the side view, it starts to look like those mini blinds yeah. when you close them. So mini blinds, when they open, create a front to back volume, if you will. Sure. And when you close them, so you close them from this way and you close them from this way, you got a double closed mini fly or reduced, right? And then this thing directly alters in addition to, and usually in concert with what the ribs are doing, this is the, this is the foundation for that. So there's a, again, a direct relationship. And so that's, I would say a, a big piece of not the exclusive mechanical thing, but it's a big giant um, satellite view of rib cage mechanics and its relationship with that. Now you start talking about, I think this is where you were, we were saying it, but I don't know if it's where you're going now, there are things connected to that. So how does sure. your um, cervical stuff relate to that? Well, it's interesting because there's the things you learn in school that are always based upon someone standing there. So. The world wants to say, there was actually a book that a guy named John Bluvernick was reading when we were on a plane to Spain at the first international NASM course. And this book, which was out of print by then, was talking about head position determines everything. And I'm going, what a, that's a bunch of bullshit. It doesn't determine everything. But the world wants to say, right. it either determines everything or nothing. I'm like, oh my God, that's just the most childish thing. You know? Does it taste good or does it taste bad? Oh, it's kind of bland, I, or whatever. So the thing is to me, if you're T1, is angled like this, then your neck, C7, has to start this way. And then to get your head back up to here, it's got to do this. And I can pull my head back all I want, and this is all I get. So people, they're like, pull your head back, pull your head back. It's like, <laughs> you got to get this. In fact, this goes si With considerably back all by its lowest, and then you can micromanage, right? But this is the center of that foundation world or whatever for this guy. Well, you start going down and people go, oh, well, then the lumbar spine's for that and the pelvis is for that. Yeah, and the further away you get from anything, the less influence there is. Because people want to say, and it's a good sound bite, well, the feet influence all that. I'm going to go, yes, yes. The higher you go, the further away you get, the less they directly influence by definition of, of direct versus indirect. Sure. So could I have pronated feet and still be here and still be here? Some people would go, no way, because I learned, memorized, without thinking, that when you're pronating your feet, you're internally rotating your hip, your pelvis is this way, you're protracting your hair. I was like, well, those things can correlate to more than just that distant foundation. Is it an influence? And this is where people have to really, really, really get an, a mature brain that's willing to go, there are degrees of influence in everything. Right. And what the world wants to do is go, oh, here's the reason. And they stop looking. You remember in class we talked about this six plus two equal eight or eight equals six plus two, and people are like, same thing. Mathematically, but not in terms of possibilities. Eight equals an infinite number of possible things on the other side. Six plus two equals one thing. We live our mental lives, our problem solving lives. A, we don't solve problems. We're told one that we don't even we can't even justify, or even if we figure out one, we stop looking. We think the rule is six plus two equals eight, and in some cases it probably is. Typically physics oriented. When really inside the body there's so much of eight equals a lot of stuff. Seven and one, I don't need to tell everybody that. Sure. But for for me to say, and I choose, I don't think anybody can be an expert in anything. And the people that are, are uh, held up that way. Um, their, their followers are blind and choose to be followers and will always be probably their whole life if they don't pull their heads out. But um, certainly that thing, that mechanics, is stepping away from the other influences uh, in varying degrees. Um, and gosh, 15 sidebars. I have people all the time that I see with Harrington rods in their spine. So I know very well how much eliminating lumbar spine anything or being positioned incorrectly by the rods, which sometimes not a choice of how they get to hold this together. How does that influence this stuff? I see it all the time. So I'm not saying there's not influence. It's just not as obvious as people want it to be 
when they oversimplify. So going back to where I was attempting to head a minute ago, we wanna go to oxygen exchange. And some people, I'm not saying you were, but this is the problem with social media. This is the problem with people. You and I don't just have a tolerance for details. We love them, maybe to a fault on a given day with a given subject, mm -hmm. right? But when people have an awareness of details and don't know how to segregate them, they go, well, everything influences everything. And what they end up doing is kind of multitasking their brain and never seeing the true power of each one of those things, nor can you appreciate the synergistic influence of things if you don't see their individual identities. Does that make sense? Yeah. So you can have a relationship and you go, oh, they're a great couple. Well, what makes it great? Oh, they're synergistic. Well, what, what does this person have that they bring to each other? And if you believe the old Jerry Maguire, uh, you complete me horse shit. Um, two empty people, it's tough to fix each other. Sure. So that's probably another story. Probably. So, but this, this, this is a huge thing. And I see that in lots of places with people that appear to be bright, but are not yet mature in their organizational skills. And because of that, they never actually go, they think they're detailed and their followers certainly do because they don't know a difference. They just like the guy or the girl, man or woman, don't get over it. Okay. In some places they don't like pronouns anymore. There's no he's and she's. They gotta get over it. There is a first amendment thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so politically incorrect is in the Constitution. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, yeah, so delineating, you want to go into mechanics, and here's what people have historically done. Because I would go pretty deep into mechanics as best I could way back when, and people are like, why are you doing all that? This stuff doesn't matter. Well, now it's funny on social media, people are attempting to draw arrows and everything and screwing it up severely. And they don't know why it matters, except I think they think it makes them cool or something. I don't know. But it's funny that there's more awareness of details, there's just very little correctness in the details. And you see it just as truthfully in people that have a master's or a PhD, PhD certainly because you, the purpose of that is to get deeper and deeper into one thing. Um, but people go, I've got a master's so I know all about that. It's like, I don't really see people with master's degree in exercise knowing much about the exercise. The exercise is rarely questioned because that's orthopedics, it's physics, right? And what they're studying is what does a mitochondria do to a marathon runner versus a power lifter? And I'm sure. like, I can't build an exercise around that. I really don't give a shit. And you don't change the way you trained to affect mitochondria. That's just a fallout piece of the puzzle that someone found interesting. You don't change the mechanics of the way you train. Nor do you, listen, if you don't change, I have yet to meet anybody that changes, and I may have met one and I didn't know it, who actually goes, I'm gonna do a thousand reps because I need this for my mitochondria. Well, you don't because it's entirely possible that what you want is a very specific thing in your mitochondria that is powerlifting. That doesn't mean it's healthy, as Louis Simmons talks about, it's so brilliant. You know, mm -hmm. we lose, a, when we start to diminish health, we start to diminish lots of stuff. It's a pretty cool thing that's relatively new because we went from general, generally good athletes they were good at everything to, wow, everything's super specific. So we got to train super specific, but then as that gets less and less healthy, we find that there's a shorter lifespan. There's actually a slight, moderate, sometimes big reduction in actual specific performance. So I'm kind of all over the map, but it's really interesting that mechanics is hard to talk about. People, not you, blend too much into it instead of saying they're different, but coming right. back and putting it together. Sure. So your interest in Rib cage mechanics was with a conversation over there with somebody else was going somewhere as its importance. Well, I, I think I, I'd like to explore its importance with relevance to um, shoulder mobility and shoulder position and going into pelvic positioning and pelvic posi pelvic mobility ultimately, right? So we get a lot of people, as you do, who e evolve into lacking pelvic mobility, pelvic stability. And some people will, will myopically go its feet. Some people myopically go its, its breathing. But it's usually one of those two that tends to be uh, attributed to being the cause. I've never seen anybody only had one of those things. Right, so it's both. So let, I'd like to explore how um, breathing mechanics is influencing pelvis. Um, so we, we, can, we can assume that uh, the rib cage is influencing the thoracic spine. We can assume the thoracic spine is influencing the lumbar spine. Lumbar spine in some ways influencing the pelvis. I'd like for you to take me down that path. So is there a correlation there with between how my resting rib cage orientation exists and how that's influencing the orientation of the pelvis? Okay. So <clears throat> a lot of people might use the sound bite that if, if something uh, more specific, if your thoracic spine influences your rib cage, then absolutely without a doubt your ribcage influences your thoracic spine. In this mechanical case, that appears to be true. Plus it seems to make sense. Now sometimes what seems to make sense only seems that way because we don't see below the surface. 
but it appears to be true here. I would prefer that people not automatically make I think back we, and should, forth we should explore that on video with me, by the way, because it may, I may be the anomaly. I will look at it. I'll let you see. Well, I'm not you're... saying here's here's the, the problem. And this is what people do all the time with should you or should not you retract all this kind of stuff. They someone who has control of their body can interrupt anything. Sure. But they have to have access to the range of motion first. They have to be able to access extreme, a, a larger range of motion, right? Well, but not necessarily. <laughs> if you had your rib cage, I'm going to use a term I hate, locked down. Some people would say, well, you're not going to be able to move your, move your thoracic spine. I would say, not true. well, could we check? Right. Why are we trying to predict? Now, you might not move it as far as if it was different. Moving, and sure. now we're back to the degrees. Thing. Sure. And so, and vice versa, right? This doesn't move, but I can still get some stuff, maybe. So that's... That's a thing. Um, the big thing to me is your, your rib cage is, without a doubt, under no uncertain terms, the foundation for your scapula. And your scapula is no way around it. I don't think we could argue with it, the foundation for all the, you know, the rest of your upper extremity. So the way your glenoid's facing and all that stuff's a big deal. And this is a problem with posture. I don't see how they don't get it. Here's somebody's thread. Let's say it's ridiculous. What's elevation when you're here? It's forward. Mm -hmm. It's and this is actually a piece of retraction. But the world thinks everything, the, the world, the industry, the everything, well, elevation is up. Well, not if your attachment is over there. Right. So those right right off the bat, what most people are thinking is going to have to be altered with its foundation. Right, so um, nobody really expects the Leaning Tower of Pisa to be straight. In fact, a long time ago, they decided we need to make sure it doesn't go any further so it doesn't fall over because we, we lose our tourist thing. And we also don't want to straighten it because we lose our tourist thing. So, but that this foundation leads to that thing. It's not the top. So it's the same thing here. So what is retraction? What are all these things? And, and we, it's not relative to the world. So without a doubt, there's some things that also less directly correlate. So if I'm trying to keep a specific spinal position for a deadlift squat, whatever the heck, the last thing I'd probably want to do is grab a bar, like we would when we would shrug with a bar, because as soon as I pronate, well, it's not just pronation, you usually internally rotate, right? And when you internally rotate, there's a tendency, while I can Powerlifters are really good at pronating and supinating and actually keeping these pretty square. They've interrupted it. But when someone just does stuff, well, now I'm protracted. And when you're protracted, it's really hard to get your thoracic spine in a not so increased kyphosis. I don't want to say get it back to something specific. So there's a relationship. Can it be interrupted? Absolutely. But why, my question is, why just because it's traditional to grab that way, when I could grab a different way, and further encourage the thing that we're trying to cue or look for. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that our traditions also often interrupt what we think we need to do for safety or effectiveness or something. So that's part of the reason we talk about myths. And sometimes they're not myths, they're just not the best idea. Plenty of people have done shrugs with a barbell and <laughs> their traps will, they're like, they're bigger than my head. But is there a better, smarter way? Maybe. And maybe the people who need it the most are who are most influenced by a better way of doing it. Because listen, if someone if someone's never sprinted and they can you know run ten flat, it's like well you could probably get better, but it would be hard for you to argue that anything I come up with would help you that much. Maybe because you see what I mean. It's right. the people are like I'm already good. I don't know, man. So now if you want to go down, well, I like to step on the shoulder. So just to deduce and maybe summarize what you said there, if so, I'm accurate. Um, there is then a correlation between someone's breathing excursion, the orientation mm. of the rib cage, mm. and the orientation of the shoulder. And yes, because it affects yes. Okay. So, so if, that's important because it, uh, I think a lot of people don't immediately acknowledge that where you rest at this, th the, this thoracic orientation relative to the rib cage is gonna impact the orientation of the glenoid, as you're saying, which is the shoulder joint. Um, and instead of just going, hey, you need to retract your shoulders, maybe there's some um, breathing preparatory stuff that you Man, can do to not, change the orientation. There's not one single thing. That isn't gonna affect. 
There's not one single thing that's not a matter of degrees. And when, so when someone says, well, retraction's bad. Wait a minute, how much? Sure. Because when I said retraction is, first of all, I never said it's good. I said it influences these things. But when I have somebody who it's not optimal for, they don't do it. But if I have somebody where all this started, because arguably I started the whole retraction idea from looking at it mechanically when nobody was even mentioning mechanics. I was totally an outlier. But never did I say everybody, the reason it became valuable to me is because it actually reduced some people's pain in their shoulder. Sure. So that makes it not just a reasonable thing to do, it, it, it according to all exploration, investigation, assessments of what someone needs, it becomes super viable. But there's a huge cohort of people who I experience, I'm sure you do too, who don't have the ability to, to retract because of lack of thoracic mobility. Like yeah. if you're here, you physically, as you said, you can't retract. Nope. So then how do we learn to access thoracic mobility? Well, that depends it, on why, 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 why is it? There? So as I'm saying, it, I'm, I'm going down this path of, is that one possible influence of that thoracic mobility, the breath cycle, which it seems like it is. That's why from the very beginning, when I would teach spine and trunk, breathing mechanics was a big deal. And I, I didn't come up with this, well, not take credit. I went to one of the many continuing education things I did when I was practicing all the time, was at Michigan State University, and they have a pretty phenomenal DO school. Um, not every state has those now, they're pretty much incorporated into uh, uh, the MD world. But these guys were manual therapists. That was the thing I was going for. And they would, they said that. And so it's like, here's to, to extend, well, so every exercise, depending on what you want mechanically from the rib cage, shoulder blade, whatever, sh the breathing should be altered. And the degree that it should be altered is based upon who you're working with. Sure. What are they going to be and What's the goal? Powerlifters do not want to breathe. They want a rock solid foundation or it ain't going to happen. Right. Do I want that for my 40 year old lady who's entered to be healthy? I need her to breathe. For all I know, she's got an aneurysm getting ready to go. Sure. So there's a totally, and for anybody out there to go, everybody, and the problem is if, if even if they, even if doesn't someone doesn't say everybody should do something, if they don't say specifically who they're talking about, they've in essence said everybody. And anytime someone says something's for everybody in the exercise world, they are wrong. Because I have a hundred year old guy and anything they say, I will show them that it's not necessarily appropriate for him. And they always go, we weren't talking about him. I said, yes, you were, because you didn't say who you were talking about. Hey guys, I interrupt the podcast with Tom to bring you a message from our sponsor, Blue Blocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Get hooked up with 15% off your favorite blue blockers. Here's why you want blue blockers. If you sit in front of a computer, your eyes will start to get weak. If you see me sitting here too long, I'll start to blink my eyes a lot. And the only way I can mitigate that is by using a good pair of blue blockers. This is not a $6 pair you get off of Amazon. Those things do not work. It's an absolute waste of time. You need something that's clinically proven to work. And Blue Box is my go-to source for blue blocking glasses that I wear almost all the time. I stopped wearing them during the podcast because the reflection on my eyes was so strong. Everybody goes, hey, man, we can't see your face. So I wear them all the rest of the time that I'm at the uh, computer. Anytime I'm doing work in front of the TV or in front of my, my phone, whatever it happens to be, you'll almost always find me with a pair of Blue Blocks on. Blue Blocks has also got their amazing sleep mask, which my, my son stole from me. Little bugger, he loves it so much. He wears it every night to bed. It sits on his nightstand and he gets mad at me if I steal it back, so I don't. <laughs> um, get back to the show, enjoy it. Don't forget to head over to blueblocks.com, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Use the code MUSCLE, get 15% off. But you were the first guy who, who ever, um, I think you're the first person who ever, who I'd ever heard it from, who suggested that maybe exhaling on exertion was not the way to approach exercise. It absolutely not for the very reason, and thank you for bringing it back to that, because exhalation is, and see here, it's another matter of degrees. Right now, I'm gonna say the way the world tells you to exhale, which is a giant <clears throat> tornado of air, well, the only way to do that typically is to drop this. Now, now you've changed lots of stuff. Mm -hmm. And if nothing else, if you're trying to go heavy, you're if you're pro, Protraction or retraction sound like there's one or the other. It's there's a degree, degree sure. and you end up with a rocking chair under your back because you don't have the tripod of your butt and your shoulder blades. So there's other, even more influences than just what's in here. But, so if I was doing something where I wanted to, I'm actually, my goal is spinal extension, concentrically, why would I exhale? Mm -hmm. My breathing is completely counter to what I'm trying to accomplish. Powerlifters might not want to breathe, and someone might go, well, that's not healthy. It's like, who the fuck said powerlifting was healthy? 
if you're willing to blow out the capillaries in your eyeballs and take drugs to it, not that there's not natural, but if you're willing to do all that, I don't give a shit if you die from holding your, come on, that's the least of our worries. Right. Most of my people are not those people, so I have concerns about it. Right. But if someone can't shift gears, so yeah, what are other things? I think you'll find if you want to get a little more detailed, number one, bench press and power lifters, they don't want to let go of this. But at the same time, if you're doing slow reps, or lots of them, you probably aren't gonna be able to hold your breath, but that's not powerlifting. So we're gonna to need to figure out something. And I used to play around with with people, what if we reverse the breathing? Well, that's such a mind mess. It probably takes a couple of days. Taking shallow, more frequent, yep. non-hyperventilating breaths, meaning as needed, not forced, well, you don't move your rib cage much, and maybe not at all if they're pretty shallow. And you keep up with the requirements of whatever. So golly, if we don't look at everything person by person, rep by rep, certainly week to week when there might change one way or the other, we don't know what we're, it's a mistake, right? Yeah. It's not professional. Well, we saying look at everything, but I think I've probably met 10 people in my life who have a, 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 ch a mental checklist of all the things you would have to go through. And I don't think breathing is typically one of them, right? No, no, no. And, but, but, you know, they do know everything then. So why would they have a checklist besides, you know, six plus two equals eight? Right. Well, so point being, I, I want to bring it to the attention of people who are listening to, to acknowledge that, yes, your big toe could influence your shoulder, but it may not be the only thing. Certainly breathing is... And it is, may be the furthest thing because right. of how far away. But... Yeah, and there might be a cascade of events. Its influence might be over time because of it went to here, to here, to here, right? Now, I am of the, if I were to stick with the principle, that what happens up here, oh, we learned at the DO thing, that when you inhale, rib cage volume mm -hmm. increases, which is an important piece of the puzzle because we mentioned, I mentioned earlier the surfactant, the stuff that holds your lungs to your ribs, well, they get dragged along with it. Rib lung volume is a mechanical thing in part, okay? So when the, what we were taught was that when you inhale, thoracic spine is going to move to less kyphosis, meaning from a flex position to a less flex position. And there's ultimately a total spine straightening. So what some people want to say is when you inhale, your spine extends. No, because your lumbar spine is actually moving to flexion to get straight while your thoracic spine is actually sure. So they're opposites. But the thing is, your lumbar spine is not attached to your ribs. So there's, it, the, they're, now they might've said it and I missed it because it was new to me, but these ribs don't have the same influence on the lumbar spine as, as they do the thoracic that they directly attach to and vice versa. Now, if I do something to the lumbar, Harrington rods, this is a funny thing when people go, well, it affects it. And it's like, sorry guys, you're not telling me anything. You've never seen anybody as, as many screwed up people as I have. I've seen people with zero, zero fused, fused joints. Don't talk to me about the influence of stuff. You'll never see anybody with the influences I've seen. I'm talking to the world in general, not you, but pretty much all of you. Um, so can you, can someone alter the influence of thoracic spinal lumbar? Yeah. And because of that, what do you, what, how in the world could the thoracic spine, I'm not saying you want to, can you? And could there be a purpose for it? Yeah, because here's another thing. Don't, let me forget to go back to the pelvis. And the reason I'm kind of going all over the map here is mostly because of social media. Part of, I think, our goal for doing this is to impart some knowledge. But the thing is, we're trying to, in large part, counter a, a horrendous storm of bullshit out there from people that kind of have some neat words right. and get a following. So we're not even talking about science anymore, we're talking about belief systems. It is unlikely that someone is a Baptist is gonna convince a Catholic they're wrong. And that's what people are trying to do on social media with scapula. So you bring up religion, you're fucked, right? right? But anyway, so um, yeah, there might be cases. Well, you never wanna stop breathing. Are you a power lifter better? For sure. So you choose this extreme and it requires extreme things very often. Nothing healthy about a marathon. Right. So, um, so my position as a coach is to go, or as an instructor for coaches, is to go in and say, I want you to have access to this continuum of things. I want you to have this ability to exhale fully. I want you to have this ability to inhale fully, whatever the range may be, and the ability to breathe in these, these shallow breaths and these ability, the ability to breathe in deep breaths. You have like, skills with the tools that right. extend. Listen, most people would treat a a framing hammer, which means a small hammer for hammering specific nails into really expensive wood. They treat it like a sledgehammer. 
you might need sledgehammer skills and you might need right. thousand dollar piece of wood skills, but it's dumb to say it's all hammering. Right. And it's dumb to say that one's better than the other. But, but go down to your pelvis, so there's no way to, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was gonna say there's was... no way to influence your pelvis without going through your, if we're talking about thoracic and rib stuff affecting the pelvis, you gotta get through the lumbar spine to do that. And the sacred... Now as soon as I fuse that, that fusion has more influence on your pelvis than anything you do up here. So this idea that there's a pathway, you know, it's not a Krebs cycle. <laughs> you right. know what I'm saying? So, and why do I bring that up? Because I don't know anything about it since I was 20. Um, so yeah, you've got to look at the current influences in the individual, and this is what people want to do. Oh, you've got tight hamstrings. How do you know that? Because something doesn't move? Oh, there's only a dozen plus other things that could influence what you think you're seeing. And here's the biggest thing I've realized. Someone goes, oh, well, I can see your pelvis is here. It's like, you know, I've been looking at very specific things and I've spent a lot of money going to a lot of places and tried really hard. And I promise you I've learned one thing over the past 40 years of doing this. I know I can't see that accurately. So what? do you think you're looking at? You're looking at a sound bite. You think that it's hard to detect what's going on in a skeletal structure when it's surrounded by tissue, fat, muscle, whatever. You get a gymnast, bodybuilder, whatever, who's got these glutes and zero fat in their low back, they will all be, it'll be suggested, diagnosed, bad word for our industry, as they're, they're hyperlordotic. Well, go take a picture of where their sacrum actually is deep within that thing you think you see. And they could be hypo lordotic, but we so don't know what we're looking at, right? right? So walking down that path. So we, we're talking about how when we inhale, the lumbar tends to flatten out. So you're getting less lordosis, obviously affecting sacrum into counter nutation position rolling under orientation of the, the pelvis tends to open in that scenario. Let's walk through that. Because obviously it's not a guarantee because you could have you could have lacking. And nobody's mentioned depth of breathing. That's going to be, if there's an influence that you mentioned, sitting here with tidal volume doing nothing is unlikely to have a measurable, even with a sure. micrometer, change. Now you get somebody who was huffing and puffing for two and a half hours or <laughs> worse than that, one rep in powerlifting or 10 reps with a heavy squat or something. That's, think about the coolness of that. So you just, you're doing this thing and if you breathe heavily between each rep because you're dying, that deep breath has a bigger influence on the pelvis you need as a foundation for a heavy squat. Of course. That's an interesting dichotomy of things going in opposite directions. You mm -hmm. need the air. You probably need to do it if you're doing 10 reps, probably between reps. But what's happening to your pelvis while you're still, even if you're not down and you're up, your pelvis is still holding all that crap. Right. So that's interesting to me, you know? And the, the <laughs> this is a terrible thing to say, but I, I have historically mostly seen people that had things going on somewhere, typically orthopedic. Sure. Um, at least as far as I knew orthopedic, there could be a, a laundry list of things that I didn't know about and probably are. But um, along with that, everybody that's apparently healthy, ACSM used to have this thing, you're apparently healthy, which never included orthopedics, right? It was, well, you might not die, right? but this is still gonna screw you up. Right. Well, that we got the same thing. No, 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 I'm, I'm only in body transformation stuff. I gotta tell you, which one of those per people is not screwed up in some way you can't detect? I always wanna say to these people, what, where did you learn your skills of differential diagnosis, of taking something that is a pain or a visible disruption in norm and where did you learn to distinguish the cause of that? Differentiate between influences. And if you did, did you recognize there's multiple influences? None of these people have the skill, nor do they have the legality, appropriateness and ethical, uh, ethical nature within the scope of their practice to do that. But the stuff you're talking about, the last time I tried to even look at those things was in the courses we were talking about. And the one thing I found was, if I didn't do it every day, which I didn't, because I'm working on an ACL over here and a water shoulder over here, and when I stepped away from s mostly spinal stuff, all those skills went out the window. And then you find along, so I, as much as I know more than most people that aren't medical healthcare manual practitioners out there, I suck at it. And I sucked then, that was one thing I found. I could sit there and do everything as best I could that I was supposed to do, laying down, standing up, and everybody can argue over which one's more important. Laying down influences it because you're weight bearing on your pelvis, but so is standing through your hips. So it's all, it's very interesting. Um, and I'd like, here's what I always saw people do. So it's this, this, this. And I'd be like, go look again. Because all I knew was, 
I always question myself first. I hate being the person who goes, it's this, and someone goes, but you missed this. I'm like, oh, you're right. So I try to do that before someone else does, you know? So I would look and I'd go, okay, stand up and lay down again. <laughs> it's the opposite. Well, how can I trust myself? My ego wants me to, but I can't. And then I could bring someone else in the room and go, because I, I trusted them more than me. I had them do the same thing. They'd they get something different than the two I got. So I don't know what to do with that, except I believe it's a degree of overconfidence within practitioners that they think they see this stuff. So what, the same what do time, we do? But at the same time, people that are good at it help. But I don't know if they're helping what they think they're helping. So let's talk about you know, what I'll call access points. So I want to improve somebody's hip mobility. We see that these things, if not done consistently, don't stick. What are my greatest leverage points? So what, if someone walks into you. What makes you think you have the right to improve their hip mobility? You, personally, this time. Well, if, if we're working together as, as a trainer and I'm trying to get you to access a new, uh, better stability or better mobility at a certain exercise. Here's the number one rule, and this applies to people with licenses like I have. Your only job is to work with what they have, never to improve it because we don't know the potentially dozen plus reasons that it could be limited. It could have been great 10 years ago and the things they've done or not done have created osteophytes and everything else. And although people want to dismiss that, that's the majority of people. 78% of the population in their knee alone over the age of 50 have osteophytes on imaging. And they're all asymptomatic. So e e even if it's some attempt to orchestrate their nervous system to make a change, there shouldn't be an attempt to improve somebody's here's, range of motion. Here's the rule. No. To improve the range of motion, here's your job. Work within, and here's, and the range of motion is the perfect place for this. Do you have to run faster than you can run in order to get to where you can run faster? It's not possible. Right. You have to lift more than you're going to lift in order to get to where you can lift more. And someone always goes, yeah, I have someone help me. It's like, then you didn't lift it, did you? So the thing is, do you have to push for more range? And I'm not saying you're stretching, but you have to push people into more range to get more range? Absolutely not. In fact, in some, if not many cases, depending on age and joint, hip, shoulder, specifically, spine, you're going to make it worse because force produces bone. Right. So... That to me is unethical to have improving range as a goal, unless you do it this way. I wanna make, I can't improve your skeleton. There's not enough time before you die, right? All I can do is try to maintain what you've done for the past 30, 40 years. Because certainly make it worse as your hormones change and the skeleton wants to change anyway. So contraction, and I use that as a collective term for the nervous system, both input and output from all the monitoring of it, the, the, the signals of it. Improving your contractile ability, which means quality, output, horsepower, <clears throat> excursion. If you improve that, you've created the opportunity to take advantage of whatever your joints have. If you do that conscientiously, strategically, prudently, pushing when you can push and backing off when you can't, and you can't improve, I'm not sure we should be trying because we work sure. within our scope. So I'm never trying to do anything except make a hip a better hip, and I have no attachment to what a book says range of motion is supposed to be. I have zero attachment sure. to symmetry, although you're perfectly symmetrical and you've I'm made the that only one, to me yes. many times. The only one. Yes. But, you know, chances are from the stuff you've done orthopedically, you're maybe not. At the ankle. Little only left, at the ankle. A little left up. Actually, it's only my right big toe. Everything else is perfect. But as you said, that affects even the height of your ears. Sure. So I've extrapolated what yes, you Yes, yes. But so that's, it's a really. So, so touchy here's, point here's where I go with this. As we age, and not that you and I are aging, but everyone else. My um, kids are. There tends to be a progression toward uh, hypersympathetic arousal, right? Too much muscle tone, resting tone increases due to stress, due to uh, chemical stress, psychological stress, whatever it is. I can show is. you people the opposite, but okay. Who, who are stressed and get less tone? Oh, well, my 90 and 100. Sure, yeah, no, totally, I get it. For, there's certain that that's, that's a, a bell curve situation as well, where there's certainly people who have different genetic But I'm just saying we gotta be careful with. Well, so most people tend to get less mobile. And it appears that, that the people we've seen yeah. may 
Right. It's not a general population you, you may be dealing with. Though. True. Well, a lot of it is. But anyway, so a lot of people tend to um, lose mobility. And what would be your approach? Is it just staying within what they've got and assuming the nervous system is going to give you back because of tissue quality improvements? Sure. And water and all the stuff you Chemical. like to talk about sure. that I don't give a rat's ass about. Right. I think vodka helps. But that's probably it, it only does. while only, the dosage only, is exactly, appropriate. Yeah. So um, joint by jo joint, there's varying degrees of what the world calls stability, which is a really tough word to talk about because are they talking about what muscles do? Are they talking about on a balance board? Are they talking let's about- Let's talk about that. No, it's yeah. not yet. Yeah, okay. okay. But so your hip has a different structural stability. Sure. Than your shoulder. Sure. Your shoulder is entirely dependent upon soft tissue. You want to keep your shoulder mobility. You need to keep that soft tissue because it is the key. If your shoulder becomes limited, it's glenohumeral, independent of its foundation and its influence. Mm -hmm. You with me? So yeah, if I want to reach back, I got to have some of this, and I got to have some of this, and I got to have some of this. But if we talk about that as a joint, the number one thing you've got is A, keep the muscles doing what healthy muscles do, which is almost impossible across a lifetime because you've done stuff with them or you haven't. Either way, <laughs> we end up in trouble. And the other thing is, um, I gotta tell you, shoulder replacements are just monstrously popular and the reduction in range is the muscle stuff, there's a correlation obviously between muscles and the health of the joint. But when one starts to go, the other starts to go, and you end up with this cascade of, of now um, um, synergistically screwing up each other thing, right? But, but until the joint gets screwed up, it's muscular health, and man, what a terrible sound bite to say, because what does that mean? Oh, it does mean water. But it is primarily the nervous system, right? And another thing we have to, and you know from your experiences with another um, methodology and practice that's out there, that um, very often, it seems that in some people that are neurologically healthy, meaning you haven't had a stroke or everything, and if right. you people think that's too many words, this is how you become accurate, is to clarify. Sure. That when some things aren't working well, other things tighten up to protect. And one of the biggest mistakes is, where blind stretching messes up, is you can negotiate freedom within that tissue that the, you know, the world thinks everything is lack of uh, length, too right. much, too much time. But if that was protective, that's kind of like saying, well, that cast is annoying, and I don't care that you broke your arm yesterday, but let's get rid of that. It's the same, maybe it's a fair analogy. Right. So, wow, but isn't that just the same thing as neurologically influenced muscle health? It is, and it's perfect. That annoying thing is good for you. Now, if you want to get rid of the annoyance, you probably ought to fill in the hole rather than taking away the safety thing barrier. You see what I'm talking about? So I don't, it's, it's a tough conversation for anybody. Um, people like to watch stuff and go, oh yeah, and they actually don't hear. And the nuances that we're saying about, man, there's a lot of ifs, that's the most important message to me in anything I say more right. than the details. But I just wanna, I feel that disclaimer is always important. But it's a tough, yeah, so range of motion is valuable. <laughs> I'm gonna say something. Range of motion outside of a practitioner, and sometimes even within practitioners that are blind about it, range of motion should, range of motion in the fitness world should never be the goal. It makes sense. A it's, healthy yeah. tissue and nervous system doing what it's supposed to do that we'll tissue will allow you to do what your joints have available. And if we don't respect joints, we're going to go right back to the same problem of shutting down the nervous system. Sure, and that makes sense. And I think to extrapolate that a little bit from my understanding is, you want to maintain what you've got by by going to where you are capable of going, and maybe then your nervous system allows you some greater muscle tissue quality. Yeah, it, or it'll improve. take you up to to the the expanse of what your structure says. All right, but so if you, you can, don't go there, you don't spend time there, you don't challenge it there, it doesn't get better. And let's go to that because there's a, a trainer on the nonsense going. Well, you need to do your flies all the way down. If you don't use it, you'll lose it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That just took a specific resistance profile to a specific place where you're actually relaxing to some degree to let the weight pull you there. We just violated everything we said in right. the joint most susceptible to being violated. People rape glenohumeral joints all the time in the gym, right? And then wonder why 
they're uh, living with this stupid duct tape on them that costs 14 times more than duct tape. Uh, if they have skulls and crossbones, that's cool. Right. But I don't know about leopard skin because that's that's weird. But um, so that's a mess. So the idea of use it or lose it, quite frankly, means all you have to do is show up there. Sure. With and that's control not and not smash that's, it. That's active. Right. What have I got? What have I got? And not not this stupid robotic looking stuff. We talk about in class exercise specific active range of motion. Mm -hmm. Because when I come back here, I've got a two joint influence that changes things compared to here. Well, which one do you want to do? Uh, do I have to choose? Really? What kind of childish game is this? How about both? And how about this is not the same as this with even more motion. And maybe this is different. Maybe it's worse than somebody. But it's really, that's why someone asked me one time, and it was a really brilliant question. Sometimes the questions where people go, oh, he's gonna unleash on that dude. But it was a brilliant question. He goes, and, and he had been here for, you know, when we had science one and science two, and, and he was like, so what do you do? And I went, that's a really good question because it hasn't become obvious to anybody yet what I would do and I don't know what I'd do for someone because I have to have them here. Anything predetermined in my world is not mastery. It's like trying to decide a fight before you start fighting. Sure. Not that I know anything about that crap, but it seems unreasonable to do that, okay? So, or decide the, whatever. Um, and I thought, here's what I try to do. And I thought about this with my partial paraplegic guy. I try to make his foot a better foot. And then I try to get him to be better with the foot he has. So while the functional world has taken over physical therapy in large part, as it certainly has fitness, they want to train my, my guy to walk. I do too. But also, if I can get a better foot in a couple weeks, that's going to make walking different. Now why? And that walking is compensation for his foot. That's not foot improvement. It's the job, the body's job is to get a around his limitation. Right. I would like to reduce it. And you can't do them both at the same time. You can do them in the same session, the same lifetime or whatever, but the, not the same activities. Because one is motor learning, and the other one's trying to improve horsepower, neurological control, internal function, if you will. Work on the motor, drive the car. So your wheels are out of alignment. When you drive the car, aren't you gonna compensate for that? Or you're just gonna go off the road all the time. Well, let's but, go deeper into that. All right, the car? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, so. Ultimately, motor control as, as compared to, you know, well, that would be your analogy for physical therapy. You're giving them more motor control. They, they, I can't, you know, I shouldn't say they, I shouldn't generalize because there's a giant so it's gambit, a huge, yeah. but it's leaned a certain way in response to right. people like Gary Gray, et cetera, who have demeaned, if not made satanic, the idea of I need to look at your foot to make your foot better. They're going to often say you need to walk to get better at walking. And I'm going, that's just literally like driving my car to try to get the alignment better. I need to compensate for my car that wants to go off the road, but I better be driving to the place to work on the alignment. Okay. Right? And so, so I, how does that start? How does what start? You somebody's start? In the alignment of somebody's feet. Well, most people out there aren't qualified to, nor should it be in their scope of practice. Well, how about we talk about from your perspective, what would that look like? Bring me a foot and we'll start talking about it. Uh, walk me down all of the different pathways. Some, what is, some suggested, okay, here's the some simple, suggested. Here's the simple principle. I've got some, some feet that don't work. Okay, so here's the simple principle. I was looking at a lady the other day who, who, uh, Wow, when she walks, it's like, this is precarious. And this is, if I let my brain go where I was taught in school, she's obviously got hip this and this and this and this. And I lay her down and start checking stuff out very remedially. She's strong as crap. Why does she have so much trouble walking? It looks, she looks like her age when she walks. And when she, when I test anything else, she's 20 years younger, if you wanted to, to stereotype. So I have her take her shoes off because I'm going, what influence do these shoes have? Well, I look at her toes and dude, they're, you would call them mangled if you thought there sure. was an external influence. They don't move, they, she can't do anything with them. Her fine motor, if you will, zero. of balance is zero. I don't care so what else like I do. So that's like 95% of people in the world. Of, and, and more so with certain age groups and there's some genetic involvement and certainly the shoes she wore as a 90 year old throughout her life. Um, and who knows all the multiple influences. But my point is, I got nothing I can do for that foot. Those toes don't move. Her big toe is over here. And her, another, what her ring finger, the last one, is completely under the rest where you can't see them. So these can't even touch the ground. And you think you're gonna stretch to make that better? 
The best thing for her would be to amputate so that we could actually work with. <laughs> I'm not kidding, Ben, because right now they're in the way. And you've, have you seen Cirque du Soleil, the people on the stilts? Sure. There's no toes on those stilts and they're pretty good. So if I had from her metatarsal heads to her heel, she would do better than she does with those toes. And you know, think there's no intervention that could bring those toes back? Sure, it's surgery and it's still not gonna work. No way she could no. reconnect the nervous system. The joints. Oh, the joints are. That's how you get to where something's 70 degrees <laughs> adducted when the toe, foot doesn't do that. So here's what would be the ideal world. Make the foot a better foot, make the toes better toes. And people go, well, he does, how about they want to plug in an exercise? You mean like the exercise where you try to do this and wrinkle a rag and do the alphabet? It's like, yeah, that's not what the foot does. You, people just made up that shit because right. they're idiots. So but what are, maybe connecting the brain into the foot. Great, but the foot has to be able to move, otherwise there's nothing to connect to. Right. Muscles can't move something that's fused. So, yeah, that, so you didn't mention that. So it was, it was fused up bone it's here. fused because of her. Right. She didn't surgically fuse it. Sure, but I'm saying there's no muscular contractile ability whatsoever left. If a muscle has nothing it can do, there's no reason for it to be there. So, right? I mean, yeah. if, I, if I fuse your knee, and I've had people with fused sure. knees, Muscles your quad go. can't possibly, your rectus can still do some hip stuff, but you're done with that guy. Right. Will it still be there? Yeah, comatose people, they have some remnants of muscles there, but you gotta look pretty deep to find them. Hmm. So, um, if I had, I would take someone's foot, and depending upon, I have a limited scope of practice with that. Um, somebody else might have much greater influence in that via the, for the practice they become skilled at. You go to a podiatrist, they have a different set of skills. They are basically orthopedic surgeons, so they will look at sometimes how do we put plastic underneath you to help or how do we do surgery to help, independent of what's gonna happen up here sometimes. So there's everybody does what they, they do, they do what their skill set is required to see and rarely beyond that. But well, here's the goal. I would like to take a foot that was unencumbered by joint stuff or whatever and make the foot a better foot. And what that means is what do toes do? Well, they do some of this stuff and they do some of this stuff. And people are like, oh, but what are the exercises for that? This and this. On a machine, obviously not, dumb question, but people would ask that about something in here. Could I use that? The tools are not the question right now. What they, I've gotta go where they are, and if they can't move it, one of the first things I wanna know that these people are not typically qualified to do is can they not move it because the joints have ended or because their ability ended? So I'm curious with a skill of infield and other stuff, wait, it'll move further. There's nothing in the way. Well, because they do have some ability to contract and they do not seem to have structural barriers, I'm thinking we got a chance here. Right. And so that's just one perspective, but that's my thing is walking on something that doesn't work will get you better at not using it, getting around totally. it. Right. And that's, the world talks about compensation, but they turn around and talk about, you gotta do the thing to get better at it. Those are completely 180 so degrees. would you get somebody like that off their feet? Or like, hey, I don't, I don't want you to walk until we can fix this? Or would you, no, would you try to have- it. She plays golf, Ben. I'm saying, would you, would you advise her to minimize the amount of- I'm just, no, not gonna get better, not gonna get worse. But what if it is gonna get, okay. What if so, someone does have that mobility, they could change it. Should they still just keep it on their, their daily routine or should they focus on some ways of, of inter, in, intervening with exercise well, that have, isn't walking? I, I, I know person you hate this person. answer, but I'd have to have the person. Yeah. And it might, it very likely would change from day one to day two. And by the sure. way, I'm not gonna really know anything. There's no, so anybody's got a canned assessment and well, our first time was an assessment. Well, then you missed about most of the assessment that occurs because the assessment is, I, over time I'm gonna find out what they can do through a right. variety of different things. In the, in, the, in, the, in the satellite view to a zoomed in view. But then along the way, as we tried things, the trying of those things tells me to some degree, wow, it seemed to help. Well, that was an assessment. Got it. The assessment prior to intervention and intervention without constant, constant assessment, those are stupid, childish things. Right. So switching gears a little bit, you have this really great video on exerciseprofessional.com. Um, about explaining forces. And I'd love to just start going down that path just a little bit. I don't want to, have to take too much time, but so most people in exercise world, and I've heard this sound about a billion times and it probably pains you to hear it, but force equals mass times acceleration. People see force as the only thing going on in exercise. We know there is forces, but people don't understand forces. I'd love for you to just start uh, 
explaining force, torque, what forces are being applied in the body. We can go down the path for shear because I know you've got some really interesting insights there. And this is more like, assuming this is, um, this is kind of a, a, an entry level for people at a low level of, of personal training, people who don't get forces, because ultimately <clears throat> we know all exercises forces, but love to have wow. you explain that. I think back to questions I've had in order to attempt to explain some of that so that it applies to maybe somebody who would have similar questions. Force equals mass times acceleration is a correct answer if I said what is force. The problem is this is not physics class. That doesn't in any way make it applicable. And I, as far as I can tell, people that take biomechanics as one of the classes in their exercise science degree that have heard things we're going to talk about like torque, I don't find them seeing them in the gym. I don't find them manipulating those things in the gym. And I'm going to say a biased statement that I can justify, but I have to also eventually go back and say why I say it. Exercise is nothing about force. What is your nervous system trying to do? One thing. Move. There's a great thing on TED where this guy says, what's the purpose of the brain? And people go to remember Move. stuff, to do yeah. all this Complex stuff. Complex movement. Complex movement. Yeah. So if, if I disconnect any of your, Botox, <laughs> disconnect any of your ability to deal with, generate force, I interrupt your ability to do lots of stuff. So while the nervous system, and this is what people don't get, well, he oversimplifies. It's like, no, wait a minute. I get the vastness and the importance of all this stuff, but if you really wanted to go to what it's for, an engine in your car is really not just to suck up gas. It's not just to make exhaust. Your electrical system in your car is not just to have battery 12 volts passing through it. It's to service things, to bring in information nowadays from tire pressure to whatever, right? As well as to regulate things, depending upon how everything's computerized mm -hmm. in your car. Those things have one purpose to make the car move. Fast, slow, better, accurate, whatever. What type of car, is it a lawnmower, whatever. But So that's an oversimplification of something that is a crazy thing from what it was. Sure. Right. So the body's the same thing. I'm gonna say it's all about force, but the problem is as soon as we say that, it's important for people to get it, which we're not gonna do here, to understand force besides the equation. And part of the problem, there's a couple of sound bites out there that I address on that thing, like for every force there's an equal and opposite. Obviously not true because otherwise, if it's always equal and opposite, you don't move. Right. So there's a little thing we got to talk about. Um, the problem is when they say for every force, there's never one or just two forces in any scenario. Amen. So you got to start piecing together all of these anyway. So there's a mess that's fun and not overwhelming. And that's one of the first things I class. So let's get away or get rid of the equation because all we did was shut down your brain with that. That's right. not fun or, or it's not, it's intimidating. Well, people just get so myopic on that, the load thing, mass. It's gotta, it's gotta be, it's gotta be load and like, whoa, hold well, on. But that's man. not even. I know, but that's their thought, right? Right, and that, oh, see, that's a, I'm glad you brought that up because they, they take force to the thing they see that is forceful. When in fact that, this is a good place to interject torque because and I've said one time, and this Portuguese guy beat it up, and he goes, because I kind of boiled down in the same way, a squat is nothing but torque production at these joints. And he goes, no, the squat is this intricate neurological blah, 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 and I wish I could speak Portuguese. Actually, I don't, because I couldn't. I want to go, dude, that whole intricate yada, 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 two paragraphs you said, what's that do? Why is it there to produce torque? Motion, yeah. Because without your torque producers, you can have all that nervous system and you're just gonna crash down to the ground. Mm -hmm. So that's the segregation problem. It's important to learn the nervous system and learn the muscles. And yeah, the, the, the reason we have them to talk about is because they work together, but talking about them working together doesn't help them understand them independently and their true synergy. Like we, you know, circle back. But, um, so this torque thing, what is that? Well, if we did the school thing, they would say it's a, f force that, um, it's a rotating force, it's a twisting force. That's the worst thing in the world to say because it's not. Forces are straight lines. That straight line has a potential influence on turning something. Now, even engineers you have trouble with this, not true engineers that do stuff, people went to engineering school and never did anything with it, because they see torque as taking something and, and it twisting, like a rod twisting this way. Right. They don't necessarily see torque in our bodies, but what they don't seem to get is this thing has an axis, may or may not be in one place, and that's a whole different subject, but this is torque. So any force produced by stuff in here any force produced by something out here is producing torque. And as we move, so torque is really how 
effective a force is at producing rotary motion, or better said, how pro effective a force is at moving you, or fighting your movement, or preventing your movement, all of which are part of movement, right. the continuum of movement. So that's why I say, dude, your nervous system, to that guy, your nervous system is bringing in information from all this, from the ground, from every muscle, from every joint, and your intention of what you're trying to do, plus the load you've put on your back, which is a torque, resistance torque, and your brain's figuring out the plan. And motor learning, skill, is it figuring out getting better at it? And even, step away from skill for a minute, you know uh, Jacques and the idea of potentiation, where it's like, and to me, a warm up, warm, fine, get warm, who cares? But a hot pack can't warm you up. What warming up really is to me at a local level, which has, it occurs there, independent of motor learning, your brain throws a whole bunch of stuff, muscle, contraction, motor units, at a problem. And then a relatively, hopefully, short period of time, it goes, wow, we cover, we does a little overkill. So we're gonna take some of these guys back because we got this covered with three guys, whatever, random number, you know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. And then it's like, well, those guys are fatiguing, so what do we do? It might, it might kind of do a shotgun approach again. It's like, eh, we didn't really need all those reinforcements. We're gonna take some. So it's this constant this, probably at a hundredth of a second sure. or whatever the heck, inside of there. That is this dealing with this locally while trying to orchestrate all of it. So it's like a truly a conductor in a symphony is going, dude, you gotta stop sucking at that tuba. Or we need more cowbell. Somebody's gonna get that, right? We, and, and then somebody goes, uh, one, one cowbell's enough. And then, but what is it? We gotta put that with everybody else for it to right. matter. Cowbell solo is not what we're looking for. Right. So, but that's constantly going on all the time. So I think when these people talk about how cool this is, I don't even think they freaking get it. I think the proponents of that are missing in most of it. And I could totally be wrong because now I'm generalizing again, which is always a mistake. But so torque, it is musk, it is that 20, 250, 500 pounds on your back, whatever the heck it is, plus your body weight. And what your brain's having to do and that quad, that quad, and all the little pieces of the quad to figure out how this one knee can play the game of fighting that in concert with the hip and the hip and the back and the back. So, right, so this is thing but that's internal torque versus external torque. It's resistance torque versus muscular torque. Hey, there's a lot of ways to say it. And I've heard somebody say biological torque, and I don't know what that means, because that could be like gastric motility for all I know. But, um, you know, when you heard your stomach's in knots, yeah, that yeah. was a joke. Cut it, I got it, man, I got it. Okay. okay, so that's a great explanation. That makes a lot of sense. I think people are gonna get that. And, and understanding that torque is forces ability to generate rotational movement. Mm -hmm. Amazing. There's videos on that exerciseprofessional.com um, share. So again, we, you and I did this on a podcast before, but it's worth going over again, um, just because. Wait, we've done podcasts? You know I have Alzheimer's, so. <laughs> three, I think. Um, um, maybe we did. Yeah, at least two, if not three. <laughs> yeah, so um, you said something yesterday about the, the shear forces of your shoulder being greater than the knee, and most people, when they attach, you may have said that. Uh, I may have misheard. Most people hear shear and they go right to the knee, they go to leg extensions. The only place that anybody's tried to scare them with shearing forces is in the knee. Right. Um, I'm going to, if you'll allow me to correct that one word in that statement, shear forces are, and it wasn't your statement, you were trying to, what was I saying? Not shear forces are greater, your More susceptible. internal, your internal tolerances for a shearing force are so dramatically different in the shoulder than the sure. knee. And, and with, um, I gotta find the right word so I don't say it wrong. Um, if we were gonna be concerned about one or the other, especially with exercise, I'm not talking soccer, I'm not talking pitching, but with exercise, controlled, non-throwing exercise, we should be more worried about this because traditional exercises, as we've been encouraged to do them, as the profile has been created, are really not consistent with this guy's long-term ability. Long-term being a key word there. Sure. This guy, I'm gonna go out on a pretty big limb, meaning pretty safe one. 
you'd be hard pressed to tear your ACL due to shearing forces in the gym. And one of the reasons I say that is years of taking reconstructed ACLs and introducing the exercise they say is gonna tear a healthy ACL and having never seen it happen, nor having heard of it happen with anybody. To a leg extension or a squat? Leg extension. So what's your opinion on leg extension? Bad exercise? Wow, uh, I, I'm going to back off from the, I know you kind of yeah, yeah. threw that at me for a reason. Um, there's no such thing as a, ooh, I've got to be careful with that. Um, I don't want to make a general statement. So as far as the leg extension goes, I'm going to say two things. There's nobody that builds a decent one. So and true. number two, if there was one, not a person watching this would really know how to use it. I don't care how many times they've done it. They usually look like a mess when they're doing it. I don't care how big somebody got from it. I don't care all the stuff, but the bottom line is, I even had one expert, truly considered an expert around the world say, well, what is there to a leg extension machine? You sit and push. Holy smoke, you're taking a set of a, a force, very specific tangentially applied force across the thing that is a, for all practical purposes, this is wrong, but it's a hinge in the way we're trying to use it over there key in the way we're trying to use it. The machine or the knee? The machine, the knee is, and and so the way we apply that force is hugely different. And then start adding in positions, places, regions of arthritis or whatever, this thing becomes a the most minute change, most important, how do I put seat back? Oh, it looks good. How do you, oh, I can't straighten your legs, so your hamstrings are tight. Um, lay the seat back. There's just all these giant, we spend two hours talking about it, we don't even get close to covering it all. Right. And that's beyond most people's attention to detail. So is it a good, used for the right person, for the right goal, at the right point in their progression, appropriate for their tolerances, appropriate for how they can do it today, doing not doing it some way when they shouldn't, and, and umping the ante when they should, it's a great tool, as is a sledgehammer. You say that there's nobody watching that can do it correctly. What is what is correctly? Is it is well, it like the I setup? Said, two, is it the resistance it, profile? Is it the execution? What are the what are the what are the pieces? Well, I just went through a really long well, list of all the pieces. Well, walk through them again. Like I understand. The, the, let's do it again. Like I want you to walk through. So let's go with design. The design of, me, the, of the exercise, exercise or the design of the thing? equipment. Well, I'm going to design the exercise, okay. and as soon as you choose equipment. How's that not a piece of the puzzle? Right, so we, we can we can automatically assume that every piece of leg extension out there is a piece of crap, and, for the and most part. And the question becomes, if you have one, right. it would what be a do? mistake to say, well, Tom said, he didn't say anything about a specific brand, but he said they're all pieces of shit. But it doesn't mean you shouldn't use it. If you know How to, what you're looking for, right. and that is not and never will be a video thing. Right. It is a give me your person and let's figure this out kind of thing. Right. And it might change tomorrow. And the next day, not that we're going to do it two days in a row. What makes a leg extension bad? Nothing. Well, you just said that the ones a out poorly there. made one. Yeah. Oh, well, there's stuff like axial alignment relative to the pad. Do you even have the opportunity to position a person? Axial alignment can also be vertical distance from the plane of the pad, which doesn't mean straight up, but it means relative to the plane, which there's some reason they're usually angled. Plane of the seat pad. Yeah. Yeah. And then that has to do with the thickness of your tissue, muscle or fat, calf, thigh, all that stuff. And that's not a deal breaker, but it's an issue. And then are, are they so abducted because of tissue? And then the bigger thing is what I'm gonna call thigh position this way. Internal rotation. Yeah, which is yeah. really a hip thing to your point yeah. right there you're making. And what opportunities do we have to change that? Do we always need to change it? Is it a matter of degrees? All these things are true, but part of what it is is I can go, well, I can't get you exactly where I want it. Somebody else, it's gonna really bug them when I'm there. So if someone can get into a position where their knee is actually working like a hinge, in alignment with the hinge of the machine, then it's not necessarily a bad exercise as yeah. far as be before we move. That's that's not even, that's just the first part. Sure, yeah, they can movement still is suck a whole. It's yeah. an exercise because of profile. So, okay, that, that's good though. That's good though because I mean, for most people, if you have the requisite mobility, which should be the objective, uh, internal rotation, uh, adduction, if you can and access those positions. This, the, the, the ability to hold those things, because right. what a trainer often does is go, good, and then they start counting, and all that stuff fell apart, oh, yeah, totally. and there's no purpose in it if we can't. Right, so if they can, that's good. So then, so that means, if you can fit with your leg extension, that means the leg extension at least checks one box. And I gotta tell you, somebody that goes, got it, as soon as you say got it, you don't. Because you've already missed things because you think you got it. Right. And I have learned to this day, I will put somebody on there and based upon what they bring to the table, I'm like, oh wow, I learned something about how to do it. You know one of the stupid things I learned? Stupid. 
brilliant, stupid, meaning stupid because I'm like, why didn't I see this 30 years ago? So you got these people and they maybe struggle to turn in and someone out there is gonna be like, oh, because they don't have hip, hip rotation. Oh, I don't know about their hip, I'm just saying they can't turn in. What are the other influences? Always the question, what am I missing? And you know what I started noticing when they sit down and they've got pants on or whatever, or skin, and their, their friction on the pad. And when they turn, that friction is resistance to keeping it there. If I actually just grabbed their pants and pulled it in like this, they could stay there all day long. If I eliminated the resistance to internal rotate, it's a dumb little thing and people are gonna start writing that, I'll do that on everybody. And it's not an everybody thing. Right. It's a when you, everything's a when you need it thing. Yeah. Um. So the check one box, we can get our we can get our knee joint in alignment here, we can get our spine in a neutral position so the hips are gonna be relatively stable. Then we're looking at resistance profile. And we know most, I mean, some machines are decent. Some machines are not great, but some machines are decent. Yep. So um, that's and great. And more so for one person than another even maybe? Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah. Um, so then checking the box of uh, execution. Which is a progressive thing. <laughs> so in terms of delivery also, so where, and where do you wanna start? Just because this is where people wanna start, is that the best place to start? That's the greatest patellofemoral force is there. And that doesn't mean good or bad, but even if I get you all set up, I might find that based on your patellofemoral structure that I can't see from the outside, we're gonna get off of this thing anyway. Even if I had the best machine in existence because the structural influences, right? Maybe I wanna start out here some, I, I've got to, the options, the list is, is, is infinitely long, but you learn to triage what matters most right now, right? You can't just worry about everything at one time, but that's still this idea of full range of motion. How does it apply to that? What's the resistance profile? And a resistance profile is very different from a strength profile because a strength profile is what you offer. It's, it is for the exercise we're talking about and many others, it is your internal torque projection and how it can't not change as you move because your internal torque effectiveness, your moment arms are changing, plus your ability to generate contraction is changing in, in a healthy or non-healthy muscle. It's changing differently right. probably. So it is supposed to change. And people go, oh, I'm weaker here, I gotta work on that. You can try, but you're not gonna change moment arms and that's 50% of the influence. So it's a, it's a tough thing for people to, to get to put in perspective. Because everybody thinks if something's weaker here than stronger here, they don't get that that's the way it's built sometimes. They're like, oh, I can fix every, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And there can be deficits too. So that's a perfect. So that's a thing. And then I, I'm i gonna subscribe to, as a general rule, and every general rule I have, I've found places where it's, I will abort. But I think it makes the most sense to have an appropriate torque of resistance commensurate with your changing strength generating capabilities. Now realize that people like you that have gotten big um, have gotten big without that. So I can't promise anybody what that's gonna do, but we spend all this time trying to make a diet consistent with the body and trying to make all this stuff consistent for not just a body, but your body. What, why would we leave that on the table? So that's exactly where I wanted to go with this. So you've spent years developing equipment or, or modifying your equipment to um, most appropriately match, I'll say this, to design an exercise for the last rep. I wanna talk about that and we'll end there. Well, that's the answer. <laughs> that's what I do. <laughs> yeah. So you're but, saying why or why? what? Why? Um, okay, so um, fatigue is an interesting thing. And most people will never really recognize where within a range they fatigue because they're so sloppy. So when they're moving, they just get generally tired. Their cheating can no longer move it for them. And I don't give a crap if somebody cheats. It doesn't, this is the thing that's important. When people start going, when to argue with me about something, I'm like, you know, you gotta understand, I'm really not codependent. I don't give a rat's ass what you do. I care more about what you do for a client because I think there's an ethics and a responsibility because you've accepted a role and you think you're a badass and it's not that easy, you know what I mean? But I really don't care what people do because that's up to them, it doesn't affect me at all. Just don't train my mom, my dad, or my kids. We're okay. Um, but the thing is, it, you start recognizing, and some of the things I learned long after school, all this stuff was long after school. Right. 
Um, now, admittedly, they had just invented fire when I was in school, so lots of things have changed. You right. know what I mean? So, um, and that guy was pretty smart, the fire dude. Just saying. They would tell us that you, you fatigue at certain parts of the range before other parts of the range. And they didn't actually say range, they said at certain stages of contraction versus others. And they, you would commonly hear among the people that talked about it, which was not commonly talked about, that the more shortened the contraction will fatigue earlier in the excursion, which most people never notice because they're doing this to get around that. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm like, wow, when you, when you actually allow, when you start searching for a way that it happens instead of avoiding it, there appears to be some truth to that almost across the board. And then you find out there's reasons why it didn't appear to happen in other things when it maybe did. But also, came to see that so much that it was a long time, a decade plus later, where I went, wait a minute, wait a minute, depending upon what we're talking about here, it occurs on the same rep at the other end, at the lengthened end. Right. Well, when you start thinking about mechanics, those two things very often have in common a significant reduction in moment arm compared to other points in the range. Sure. Is that a piece of the puzzle? I think I could go along, and I've tried to explain in class why it might be. Um, certainly moment arms don't get tired. <laughs> it's just a mechanical measurement. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a linear measurement. But, you know, there's also things that we think we know about sarcomeres contraction, shortening and lengthening within a sarcomere. Got to be careful with all. All the original studies on that were with fibers taken out of the body, so they don't apply. And there's even books now saying <laughs> they don't apply because we can't lengthen something that far in the body. And if we did, you wouldn't be able to move because mm -hmm. we're taking it beyond blah, 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 blah. That's a fun discussion that went from length tension as not only being only 50% of the story to not even being 50% of the story because it doesn't hold true in everything to the same degree of influence. Right. So there's a variety of reasons. And interesting things is when I adopted a certain philosophy, um, offered to me as, as in part of an interview, uh, informal interview, years ago, when he was talking about having worked with somebody who was majorly influential in our machine world, exercise world in general, and lots of stuff. And I'm not gonna mention his name because people are like, oh, well, instantly, I don't like that idea, right? Um, I was like, okay, I've got some decent testing equipment, isokinetic stuff that you can't use with motion for reasons we talked about. You stop moving, it stops reading. So you can use the isometric and you find stuff. But for all my testing yeah. of that stuff, I didn't find it to be entirely directly useful and applicable and, and, and exact for exercise. And the thing that showed up was your fresh rep, I wanna say first, and your last rep, which I can't actually say because I don't know how fatigued you get. So I'm gonna go your first, your fresh rep and your failed rep are, are, are commonly very different in a pretty predictable manner. So when I started saying, okay, I'm gonna take this secondhand philosophy, this guy told me the other guy's dead, and I would have loved to meet that guy. He's just eclectic and genius and hated people, which is, I have a kinship, you know? <laughs> so, um, start trying to build equipment to match this idea that when you fail at one point in the range, you fail at the whole, you can't do it anywhere else. Now, the thing that that guy seemed to miss, although I didn't get to interview the original guy, there's a time component. How long do you spend on each, throughout the excursion? You know what I mean? Because certainly the slower you go, by the time you get somewhere else, you fatigued a lot before you got to each place. Right. So you gotta, if you're gonna test any of this, you gotta choose, you gotta eliminate the variable of time. And then in workouts, you change time. So what you do if you think you got it close doesn't always be as close depending on how you do the thing. But because the tendencies are very similar, it's way better for what I'm looking for than, than if we haven't messed with this. But the thing I started looking for was my fresh rep. Now realize if you were doing one rep, one rep to failure, your fresh rep and your failed rep are in one rep. It occurs from when you unrack the bench press to off your chest and before you get back up, you're hitting your failed rep. So it applies, right. you see what I mean? But if I build something as well I can to where it 
feels, if we were to use that as our only tool, which we don't, um, you can't finish the set. You still got to, when you get to one end, you can't do it anymore. You might have 15 more somewhere else. And to me, people have gotten big doing that. They get spots at the top. There's all kinds of traditional ways of remedying that, but it's like, wouldn't it be fun if we had something that was more consistent with human strength profiles headed towards failure? Because to me, isn't that what we're all trying to do? There's, just, there's some degree of fatigue, effort requirements that appear to be useful in this, depending on your goal and your tolerance, that kind of stuff. I don't find it so much with my 100 year old and I do, I, I enjoy it. I'm probably addicted to too much effort historically and you know, whatever, at 60 it's different. But um, so experimenting with this and getting, as you've noticed, pretty darn close on some of them and I never stop because I'll use something for a while and I'm like, man, this is awesome. And then a month later, I'm like, I think this is shit now. Let's work on this because you get more and more. Sure. But um, it's an interesting, interesting thing. And um, yeah, I have some other goals, I think, that down the road I really don't want to talk about in terms of where to go with that that might be fun. But I've learned more about strength profiles by trying to match them and failing. Right. than any version of testing I have available. Match them with designing exercise, with manipulating the machines you have. And it's, I have this blessing, this serendipitous thing that happened in my life where I decided, I'm kind of one of these guys where it's like, I, I can buy that, I can build that, you know what I mean? So, and when I was 19, I taught myself how to weld because I wanted a squat rack at my house. And um, I usually overbuild stuff, so. Um, and I overweld stuff is where I'm going with that. It rarely fell apart. Plus I would make it structurally sound so that yada, yada, yada. But along the way, you start getting braver than just putting some sticks together with holes in it. And you start thinking, what can we do to this? And I love trying simple ways as prototypes and simple ways because other people might be able to do them if they have similar equipment. But at the end, more recently, I've been like, let's just cut the crap out of this thing and see what we can do with it. Or cut frames apart. Cut slice cams do it you know and, and people need to know it's not all about the cam the cam is one small small moderately influential way of doing this most people don't see that there's companies out there that say we're going to manipulate the cam position and we alter this thing and they're it's hard for me to believe that they've really as a company missed the other four five six seven eight places that are making the cam where it's supposed to be harder not Harder. Right. And I explained that to someone yesterday, and I, I didn't know when I first looked at well, it. Well, but the marketing tool is do this. But what's funny is you can just measure it. Object. It's not me saying that. We've we we've, we've measured stuff, yeah. and it's like it doesn't seem to do that. Right. You know? So anyway, it's a fun thing, and that's you know it'd be nice if someday this was uh, reasonable to to provide to people who cared and who got it. I don't ever, I never pretend to participate in anything that the masses should enjoy or right. even understand. Well, I'll tell you, the subjective experience is exponentially different. Like your ability to take one set so much further and feel it in the right place and, and almost like overcome that natural tendency to just, with every other machine, you fail in some place and you feel like you kind of had some more in the tank. But these ones are just like, I just keep going and going and going. And when I'm done, I'm done. Like, I couldn't even budget. That, that it takes is a near exponential attention to not trying to get out from under the challenge. Mm -hmm. And our brains want so desperately to make things easy. And the harder it seems to get due to fatigue or whatever the heck, we want to bail fast. And to get to a point in the range where it's like, your brain says, yeah, you're good, don't worry about it, or you're good. And to actually suck it up and get through it, that's what makes this experience really, really but, like holy But But crap. I think that's only possible when you have a resistance profile that's effectively designed. There. Yeah. But that's, that's part of the thing, is now you've got a new place to suck it up through. Right. There's a learning curve there, and a desire, right, first well, I think you, we have this learned tendency of like, I just simply can't do it, so I stop and I go back the other direction. That seems to be the case with everybody. Well, we talk about, and back stuff's a great place, because those profiles are exactly backwards from, wow, I never noticed that before, from, <laughs> <laughs> that's fun, yeah. so from the body. But we've all we've been happy with it forever. We've all done it. It's just the way it is. But where where I, I think I'm trying to go with that relative to what you said, I, I've years ago I started thinking of when I started doing this myself. Wow, when I got on one that I could intellectually think of as better, 
I had to open up a whole new file. And what I mean by that is, well, you've been doing pull downs forever or rows forever with cable. You got this thing in your head of con a conditioned thing of here's what those are supposed to feel like. Based partially on your execution, partially on its design, meaning its profile or whatever the heck. And so you come to think that's what it's supposed to feel like and that's good and that's right. And if I was to offer you something that was, first of all, you only see it as different. You have to trust me that it is in some ways, in some context better. Um, I can't promise you will get bigger or anything else, but, um, and you're gonna do it with the same old file and you might go, well, it sucks. I'm like, okay, we gotta keep that file. Don't ever get rid of them. But we gotta open up a whole new thing and you gotta be willing to abort and, and start from scratch now, because of someone being in tune with her body, it should be a short learning curve. But this is, that's the key to this, is the willingness to, to not think that everything you've experienced and the files created are the best way. Because people intellectually go, no, 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 I'm always trying to learn, I'm always whatever. But I don't see that in action. And I don't see that in the commitment of their intellect. So that's a, that is probably for most people why they'll never really experience this because they can't, uh, there was a guy at your gym, a, a good guy. And really good, I, he was excited, you know, about talking and let's look at this machine. I wasn't thrilled with the machine for its profile and even its handles and stuff kind of were in his way for his, this. But when you start playing with it, he's like, oh, cool. And he, he seemed to be a cool kid because he could take things and run with them. So I was like, yeah, I'd probably get some webbing and try this. And he's like, oh, over the gym looking for webbing and, you know, and, oh, I, and it was great. But then his execution, although from across the gym and from everywhere else, people would go, he's got great form, right? But I'm like, for what he said he wanted out of this, for what he couldn't feel before and wanted to feel, his goal, not yours or yours or yours, it was gonna require a new file. It was gonna require not getting back here, and he was, he wasn't even popping it that much. He was back here and skimming it. Never really got there. Instead of slowing down and making what he wanted thought he wanted to feel, produce it. And you saw his eyeballs go like this. Now the machine, as we messed with it, gave us the opportunity for that. But in the end, the exercise is only marginally the design and the rest is the intention and the execution. So that's, that's any tool, listen, I can have a hammer, but it's not gonna keep me from hitting my thumb and it's not gonna make me be a, you know, not bend the nail. That's intention and skill of execution. Amazing. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Thank you so much for tuning into our show with Tom Purvis. Hopefully, you learned something. Hopefully, it blew your mind. Hopefully, you'll start to look at exercise a little bit differently now and forever. That's really the goal, right? One of my greatest missions in life is to change the way exercise is, is done, change the way people look at exercise, change the value that exists in exercise. And you guys have heard me talk about this in the past. You're going to hear me talking about a lot more going forward. How to turn exercise into a mindful experience, experience that increases consciousness and ultimately allows you to become virtuous, right? We want to become a virtuous human being. What does that mean? Well, I want to develop virtues. I want to develop discipline. I want to develop character. I want to develop resilience and persistence and all these incredible, desirable virtues. And every one of them exists in exercise. And the prerequisite to all of this is first, you got to become mindful you got to become present. You can't change something if you're not present. So the first and most vital step in the process. <sighs> Breathe. Slow down. Become present. People always ask me, Ben, how fast should a rep be? Does tempo matter? And the answer is, of course it matters. But the most important tempo is the one that's controlled. Or the best tempo for you is always going to be one word, and that's control. Slow down, control what you're doing. Make sure the muscle you're actually training is the thing doing the work. It's not just, hey, I'm just lifting this thing. I'm trying to complete three sets of eight, which is a complete waste of your time, I believe. I mean, for if you're a beginner off the couch, awesome. Good for you, man. Go do it. Three sets of eight is better than nothing. But if you're someone who actually wants to optimize, which I know you do, you got to focus. You got to slow down. You got to aim to challenge a muscle. And then look then where your, psycho your, your psyche wants to get out of hard work where you want to kind of, mm, that's hard, I'm going to stop that. Or maybe I went mindless for a second and the set stopped. And the next time you get in there, you go, no, I'm going to get back in here. I'm going to go a little bit further in order to go to the deepest depths of your soul, whether that be because of hard work or because of deep focus, it requires you being mindful. You have to be present because there's always going to be this, as soon as you go unconscious, as soon as your brain turns off and starts thinking you're going to stop, 
So the deeper you can get into this mindful state, this focused state, the further you can take every single set. And this has become a superpower for me. I can go so much deeper into a set now than I ever could, certainly early in my career, because of my ability to become present and mindful in the moment and feel the discomfort, but consciously choose to go into it rather than stopping and mindlessly turning off. I think a lot of us turn off a set, and if I ask you why you stop, you go, oh, I don't really know. I just kind of got tired, so I stopped. Well, no. The way we, reason we stop a set is because we've taken it as far as we possibly can, and that muscle actually fatigues and fails, right? Most of the time, I'd say 95% of the time, it's not the muscle you're training that, that fails. It's something else. It's your consciousness. It's st your stability. Maybe it's the burn, like the lactic acid, which is still not the muscle you're training actually fatiguing, is it? Well, it's fatiguing, but it's not failing. So something to think about. And uh, again, I digress. I hope you guys have enjoyed this podcast. I hope you're enjoying the muscle intelligence mission and the message to ultimately help you live your greatest life in a body you love. And now shifting into how to use exercise to become a hero, how to become the most virtuous version of yourself. I'm so excited to continue to communicate with you guys through this platform. As you guys see, I kind of don't use social media as much as most people do because it's just also curated and uh, manipulated. It's, it's a challenge for me to not be able to communicate directly with what I want. So let's use a different medium, right? Let's, let's get on here and chat together. And, and guys, I'd always appreciate your feedback. I do go on social, so send me some uh, messages or please, as always, leave a review. Do not forget to subscribe. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning into Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.